Hey, welcome to Buy Box Breaking with No Fun Dave. I have a special, special guest with me today. His name is Tony Make Me Some Delicious Pops. I mean, Tony, grill up anything amazing in the barbecue. I mean, uh, Tony Lombardo, he is one of the most interesting people that I have ever met. Um, I would say anybody that knows this guy knows of his fullness of life, joy, love, um, he makes people laugh. He makes people smile and lives his life in the way that he wants to. Um, pretty much always. He's got a, an amazing wife, Danielle, and two kids who are what, nine and 11, 10 and 11, 10 and 12? Oh, a little more. They are uh, 11 and no. 13 soon. 11 and 13. So yeah, it's way off. Anyways, welcome, Tony. Thanks for coming on here. Say hi. Well, uh, Dave, pleasure. Um, I can't say I agree with your no fun Dave because you're super fun Dave to me, but whatever, dude, whatever. that's the fun of it though. It's tongue in cheek, right? It's like, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 I'm talking about things that are no fun until you realize that they are amazing because they bring life. So there you go. Well, no relation to you, but, um, this was the thing I wanted to tell you because, you had mentioned all the stupid things I do in my life. And um, like a couple of years ago, I was, people were like, wait a minute, you're a comedy writer, you're a photographer, you're a filmmaker, like all of these things. I'm like, yeah, but they're all just storytelling in one way or another. Whether I write an idea and write and film a sketch about it or turn it into a photograph to me it's still i just enjoy storytelling in very short bits that's what i've always loved i grew up on sctv and kids in the hall so you know sketch comedy to me is the most beautiful art form in the world and a photograph is the shortest sketch you can make Ooh, that's that's well said yeah, um, my biggest photographic influence is The Far Side by Gary Larson. Oh, I've never taken oh photographs. brilliant. Just right? brilliant. Mm -hmm. So last Thursday, in the world of just balls out, I don't care, I reached out to, and no relation to you, uh, do you know the photographer Chris Buck? I've seen him in my Facebook circles, but I don't know him. He is a really, really quirky portrait photographer, an enormous influence on me, um, has shot, you know, so many celebrities, especially a lot of comedians. And um, he just, he's weird. And that's what I love about him. And so I reached out to him and said, hey, man, I'm trying, I'm not new to this photography game, but I'm trying to transition into something would you offer any mentoring or anything like that? Totally don't know the guy. And he just says, yeah, sure. Let's hop on a phone call. And he totally gave me an hour of his undivided attention. And I was just so grateful for this guy just giving me his time. And just, he, he said, okay, well, I want to help you with your business. And so, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to shoot bigger campaigns. I want to shoot you know, big ad campaigns and I'm trying to get through to creative directors and I want to shoot big editorials for magazines, but I, you know, I, I just don't hear back from photo editors. And he goes, well, it's a bit of a numbers game. You know, you send a hundred emails and a hundred mailers, maybe three get back to you. He goes, that's, that's pretty common. I'm like, okay, so that's what it is. And I said, like, I know networking has a lot to do with it. And then quote, I said, you know, like a couple weeks ago, I was in a commercial, I was an actor in a commercial and the, the agency was there and I was like, Oh, this isn't really the time or place for me to mention my photography. And he's like, wait, wait, hold on. You were acting in a commercial. I said, yeah, yeah. I, I, I had a really popular sketch troupe. I've, I've been a comedian for many, many years, a couple decades, you know, like just for laughs and all that stuff. And he's like, Oh, okay. And then a little bit later than that, he's like, well, what else do you do? And I'm like, well, we run a wedding, business as well so i shoot weddings he's like you shoot weddings <laughs> you're a comedian you're a photographer and then he goes 
you know, I don't want to argue with you here, but short of trying to be a professional basketball player, like you're trying to do all the things. And I'm like, yeah, I guess I just get bored easy. And he's like, well, if you cut out all those other things, you'd have nothing to fall back on. He goes like me, he goes, I only have this. And so it forces me that when I don't have that work, I put in the time to do the mailers, do the emails, do the networking, da, 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 da. To which I'm like, yeah, that sounds like the last thing I want to do is to do those things. I'd much rather do something else. And that's why I'm not getting those big jobs because I'm not putting in the time to do that. It's like you go up on stage with a sketch you haven't read. Like the rule of thumb is one hour per minute of stage time. If you've not put in that amount of time in rehearsal, you expect this thing to just take off and be awesome? It's impossible. So he's like, cut out all those other things and work on those big projects that you want to get. I'm like, or realize that those aren't the things I want and I enjoy the variety. He goes, yeah, there's that too. Mm. And Mm. so I've had this like major soul searching for the last four days of, of those words that he said about, you know, having gratitude for the fact that I'm, into all these other things and I'm always wanting to do something else, but you know, I, I don't know if that's the Gemini in me that just, you know, life of half read books, but I'm happy. So I can't really argue with it. That's, that's, that's very, very interesting. I, I, it's interesting from the perspective that, that what I've been looking at recently, you know, in, in light of the, these podcasts and the books that I'm writing and that kind of stuff is that uh, what you want, uh, what when you choose that you want dictates your passions and your passions dictate your actions. So if you're passionate about something, you're going to go do that thing. But what are you passionate about? Well, you're passionate about what you choose to want. But if you don't know what you want, it's really hard to direct those passions towards any actions because you don't know what you're firing at. You know, if you fire at a non-target, you're never going to hit it. At least if you have a target, you can you can aim for it, right? Here's the thing is those words you just used for real life is, you know, actors and directors use those words to bring a character to life on a screen or a stage. It's like, what does this character want? What would he do to get it? Right. So that's how else are you going to make a character believable on stage or on film if we don't know what he wants? And, and some and of the so things that I'm trying to your life is like, well, you have to know right. what you want. Well, that, that's, to some, of the, some of the things that's so interesting is that when you, when you, when you watch a movie or a, a, a strange presentation, or I, I, I love movies. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sticking on the movie target topic here, but like you can see all the characteristics in a movie character that you want to be, or that you wish you were, or that you would aim for, but you never actually take that. Well, I'm going to speak in generalities here, but you know, most people never actually take a look at that and say, okay, well, what do I want? You know, you, you look at, I was looking at um, a list of, of um, superheroes and movies of, of li- things that I like and not necessarily a superhero, like a Marvel superhero, but like a superhero as the main character, the guy who's got the, the, the plan, you know, the mission impossible, Tom Cruise guy, the, the, the James Bond guy. And, the, the one characteristic above any other that they all have is they all have the ability to be calm under pressure. They all have the ability to um, have control of their emotions, to keep thinking when there's a high pressure situation. And we can look at that and we can see that in a movie, but then we look at real life and we look at our actual actual responses to things is like, no, no, you got to, you know, you got to be in touch with your emotions and let your emotions out except that the people that we watch the outcomes of their stories, they, they come out and they're like, no, no, you got to have control over the emotion first. Now the emotion is the response to the thing that happened, not the thing that must happen in order. You know, it, it, it's the second thing, not the first thing. And it's just so interesting to hear you say that because, you know, when we look at stories is the great communicator in the world. So story is a great communicator to humans right. is that when we hear it in story, we can understand it. Well, especially with your master storyteller, Tony, those, those heroes that you're talking about, though, have to be that clear cut and dry. 
Conan does not debate whether he's going to kill that horde of, of intruders. James Bond doesn't debate if he should go skydive out of a plane with a watch that has lasers out of it to, you know, catch that evil uh, villain, right? But it's in other movies where you don't have clear-cut heroes where they have to make choices like that. And it's in the choices that you understand character, you know? it's That's what makes the it's. You know, well, even though it's Spider-Man, but like, you know, the famous like Gwen, save Gwen Stacy or save the people in the subway train. Mm. That decision is what tells us what kind of person this is, you know, and, uh, you know, being an true, but the but the ability to make that decision, Tony, requires that they're not panicking because they're making and making a choice. Yeah. They have to gather the information. Do I grab this person or this train? Now, well, I mean, let me bring it back to you then, because when you reached out to me, you were like, hey, remember in like 2018, you called me out of the blue and and I called you and I was like, yo, man, like, where are you? Because I'm seeing all these images you're posting and I'm like, do you live in Canada anymore? And like, you were living this lifestyle that I didn't understand how you were doing it. And my goal at that point was to sell my house and move to the mountains. And you walked me through a very simple way of like, well, you're not going to die. You're going to figure it out. It's going to work out. Like you just coached me through that. And it really had an effect on me. Now for other reasons, we didn't pull the trigger on that decision, but that learning from you is that in a couple, a couple of years later where Canada, in my opinion and in yours too, just became a rotten place to be. It took us yep. no time to say, all right, we're out of here. It's going to work out. Right. It's going to work. It's somehow going to work out. I have no worries about that. And, uh, and it's just in getting pushed into those, it's like, the decision was, it wasn't a him and a ha decision. Now, coming back to Canada, I meet so many people that I tell them this story of, yeah, we moved to Bulgaria and we were living in the mountains and we didn't speak the language. And it's like, it seems like a terrifying thing, but it was such an enjoyable adventure that people are like, wow, you have a lot of balls. And I'm like, I guess you just hemmed and hawed. Like you weren't happy here, but you you sucked it up and lived in, in that. Whereas you, me, and a bunch of other people we know left the country and went on an adventure. And I think that's one of the things that I, I'm so sad to see is how many people in the world are, you know, live in this little box that they make for themselves, either due to choice or due to, due to inaction or, or in, in non-choice and say, oh, okay, well, you know, maybe if I just do this terrible thing a little bit longer, I'll get what I want <laughs> after that. <laughs> You know, it's yeah. the great, it's the great Western lie. It's like, okay, well, and it starts in elementary school and it, it, it really ticks me off because you get, you know, you get your elementary school, oh, well, you just got to get good grades. You know, you got to behave in school and then you can get into high school. Okay. Well, you get in high school, oh, you just got to get good grades and you get in university, you get the right university. And then you get into university. It doesn't really matter what you, what program you take. You just got to take something. You got to get a better education so that um, you have something to fall back on. And then, and then, you know, maybe when you finish that, then you can get a good job. Okay. What's a good job? A good job is where you get to stay in the same office for the entirety of your working career with no threat of any problem, growth, fear, scariness ever happening to you where you can ho-hum humdrum through your life until you maybe have a couple of dreams of retirement and get to, oh, hey, I got to go to this one place after I retired by the time you can't walk anymore because you've been sitting in a chair your whole life and not get to see the thing you wanted to see in the first place, only to die. Like, it it just seems so silly. I am living proof of that principle because come come university, I was, okay, I will get a degree I get a degree in English and I will go to teacher's college because the teacher gets two months off in the summer. And that seems like great. That was literally, there was no, I love to teach. There was no, I want to be a teacher. There was none of that. There was no love for what it was. It was 
based on how much time off I would have from teaching. <laughs> so then by the, yeah, so then I got into theater, blah, 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 yada, yada. And by the time fourth year rolled around, it became obvious to me that securing a job teaching, especially in the GTA, was pretty difficult to do. And there was no guarantee of a job staying with me. So I'm like, well, if I'm going to spend time doing something that there's no guarantees, then I'm just going to go balls out and go all no guarantees and try my hand at acting and I'll get some headshots. Right. You're, you're, it's going to be out. hard either way. It's, yeah. And it's, it's going to be hard either way. So you might as well do the thing that you want to do. Right. And that ended up with creating a comedy troupe and buying a van and traveling all over the country just for laughs, LA, New York, all over this kind of, like, I'm like so thankful that I made that scary decision to just not go to teacher's college and become a traveling thespian, right? Is it because you wanted to drive around the country in a stinky van with a bunch of other men? Want to hear, want to hear a crazy story about that? Yes, I do. This is probably the craziest thing I've ever experienced. So, uh, my friend Eric and I have had been friends since grade 10, okay? And by the time grade 12 rolled around, his older brother was sending us postcards from Costa Rica. And him and some guys bought a van and traveled all the way down to Costa Rica and were living on a beach in the woods and da 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 And we're like, wow, that's so cool. When we graduate, we should get a van and travel to Costa Rica. But then as, as the time got closer, we're like, you know what? We don't really care about Costa Rica. But we do care about traveling in a van and doing something. And we both have a sense of humor. So, hey, why don't we write a show, get a van, and travel and, and just perform? That led to the next 15 years of our lives, traveling, doing comedy, blah, 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 blah. Now, That's fast amazing. forward to I'm at my aunt's, uh, no, my my wife's aunt's house for a family function and her second cousin marries some guy named Adam and blah, blah, blah. I start talking to Adam. Turns out Adam went to the same university as Eric's brother who sent us all those postcards from Costa Rica. And so then um, he goes, Oh yeah, I know Mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then I say, okay, well next time I see Mark, I'll tell him you say hi. And so then I see Mark and I'm like, Hey, um, your buddy, Adam, from uh, your university says hi. And he goes, oh, man. And Adam loved our comedy troupe. Mark says to me, oh, my God, you're not going to believe this. Adam, he bought a van, moved down to Costa Rica, used to send us postcards, and that's the reason we did that. So Adam did this thing with a van, which influenced Mark, which influenced me and Eric, which created a comedy career, which Adam ended up seeing and loving. And I'm like, you have no idea. You're the reason why <laughs> I just had the last 20 years of my life in comedy. That's awesome. So chew on that. That's crazy, eh? That's amazing. So are you, are you doing anything with it? You, you mentioned, I think six months ago or so, you were looking at doing some comedy stuff again. Are you still looking at that? Yeah, I, um, I found a, uh, a fellow colleague. Uh, I was listening to a podcast, and I was listening to this guy, and I was loving all the stuff he was talking about. And he had a, a, a sketch comedy show called Simon Essler's Comedy Dystopia. And I found out he was from Toronto. So I reached out to this guy. We went and had coffee, and I'm like, let's, let's work together. Let's, let's do some stuff. And so we started writing and pitching to each other. And now this year we're going to start filming some sketches. And I'm like, I'm in this mode now that my brain is like, oh yeah, comedy. And every other idea, I got to write it down. Whereas for like the last 10 years, you don't ask me to write a word. I just didn't feel it. But now I'm like, I so feel um, the comedy vibe that I'm just, my brain is constantly thinking in sketch. But I think what it has to do, too, is that my comedy troupe was a very absurdist style of comedy. And with Simon, we have a lot more of a, a satirical, cultural and political satirical slant to it, which is nothing I used to write before. So I'm like, oh, this is this is super fun. I got lots of things I want to make fun of. 
making fun of things is one of the best things in life. It's the root of comedy. <laughs> you gotta have hate. Comedy comes from hate. Well, and what, what I find so interesting is is people's um, like we we love laughing at, at others, and I'm just gonna I'm gonna touch back to personal stuff here. But you, you touch back, you you you, um, you know you laugh at other people, but if somebody was ever to laugh at you, it's like oh well, now I can't handle that. I can't I can't handle you know, and I I heard I heard a, a comedy a comic do a bit once about the punchline basically being, are you telling me that if you had a camera following you? From the time you got up to the time you got went to bed, and you watched it back, that you wouldn't find some stuff in there that was funny. Oh, like, you, yeah. you've got to take a look at your life and say, if we can't laugh at ourselves, what can we laugh at? Some of the things we do are ridiculous. We were in the airport yesterday, and there was a business in the airport that was a nail salon in the terminal. Now. I don't have my nails done and I don't understand the world of having my nails done, but you're telling me that there are enough people in the world who are like, Hey, hold on a second. I got a half hour before my plane takes off. I better get my nails redone. Uh, it, so much so that you can have a business. <laughs> right, I probably call money. that a money laundering operation, but sure. Oh, I guess. But you I know, guess, it's funny but... because what you said is, is one of the principles of comedy that we used to live by was, People like to watch other people suffer. It's fun to watch other people suffer, but in comedy, they can't get hurt. That's the only rule. Mm. And Mr. Bean, you know, Rowan Atkinson made an entire <laughs> career off of that principle. It's fun to watch other people suffer, but they can't get hurt. If they get hurt, then we're into a drama. Mm. That's interesting. So, and this is what I've I... said a lot in terms of comedy is like, comedy is a craft and like your whole follow me around with a camera all day is I've said to anybody, it's like you funny things happen to everybody every <laughs> single day. If not 50 to a hundred times a day, something funny happens. The difference is, is that a comedian will write it down and then the next day say, was that funny? And then how do I pull it apart? How do I make the extremes? How do I, how do I shape the roller coaster of this? of this story so that it's a repeatable story that every time I tell it, it brings the people through that same roller coaster. You know, there's a marvelous, there's a wonderful uh, illustration of that in the marvelous Mrs. Maisel Amazon program. Oh, okay. Uh, and it, it shows her perfecting her, um, um, uh, what do they call it? Her 30 or, or their, yeah. you know, she's got a solid, a solid 30 or something like that. And, and so it, it, it shows her telling the same funny story in a different way, five ways in a row from not so funny to missing to better to almost there to actually getting a guttural laugh out of it. And it's like, my goodness, it's the same story. It's just how you relate it or how oh, you yeah. pop it in there or where well, you finish with. One of our exercises that we would always do is, okay, we we're off book. We know the script. Okay. We've blocked the thing. It's technically it's ready. So now Let's do a run of this sketch where we're really sad. And now let's do one where we're like super excited and really happy. And it's simply for the, the experience of like, let's go over there and we might learn something that we might want to take back when we, when we actually do it or oh, down there, you know, that way I delivered that one line, I might take that back with me and, and shape it into that thing. And it just, if anything, it's just an exploration. And that's the thing I find about art is it's about taking these risks or these calculated risks that we do it all the time in photography. I, I, I don't know about you, but it's like, okay, here's the safe shot. Now let's do something so messed up <laughs> and just see where it takes us. Cause we know we already yeah. have our safe, but let's take mm -hmm. a couple of risks and see what we end up with. You know, right? like I, I had a, um, a guy that worked for Bombardier, you come for a corporate headshot. And in a Zoom meeting, I saw in the back, he had all these toy trains and all these toy cars and toy planes. I'm like, what are all these models? And he goes, oh, I, I collect these models and die cast replicas. I'm like, bring them to the studio. And I did this really great shot of him with in a suit with a fisheye lens. And I'm like, that, that plane, like pretend you're throwing it at me like you're a five-year-old in a paper with a paper airplane. And it's a great shot of him. Sure, I got the nice safe of him in the suit just smiling. Mm -hmm. But I also got that other one. That, if anything, is just for me. 
to make me happy that I did something neat out of this shoot. Yeah, but the stories that we tell in life aren't the safe in the box stuff. <laughs> it's always the, well, that's, it's always that's the crazy problem. things. The story lives in the extremes, never in the middle ground. Mm -hmm. And I find that, that I equate that to the news. And I, that is, I think, a prison that people find themselves in is they get stuck in the prison of, oh, my God, this is so bad. Oh, my God, this is so bad. Like, there was, I was out in, uh, in BC, I was in Alberta last year, and somebody, I was ordering a pizza somewhere, and the guy said, oh, you're from Toronto, there's a lot of, a lot of violence on the, on the, on the, uh, the, the subways right now. And I said, well, it might be, or as I know, a lawyer around here did some studying and the incidence of violence had not gone up, but the incidence of reporting had gone up. So again, mm. we're just dealing with words that were being told that shape your reality, right? That's like Truman show. We are presented, we believe what the reality that we are presented with. So, I, I mean, talking about people in boxes, talking about making weird and radical changes and, and, and crazy decisions, you know, a lot of people sit in their, in their cubicle, let's, let's call it, um, yeah. a cubicle meaning cubicle of life. You're like, oh, I'm just going to do this day after day after day. Um, and I often hear from people, well, I couldn't ever do anything like that because fear, 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 or because problem, problem, problem. How do you go about, you know, mentally thinking through, okay, I'm going to actually, I'm going to actually step out and do this weird and crazy and unknown thing that has, has, uh, unknowns written all over it. How do you, how do you actually pull the trigger? I can't say that I'm as risky as I think you're riskier than I am, but I, I often, I look at things <laughs> like, I mean that, but I, I often look at things like, what are that handful of things that I'm really good at and really comfortable with? I don't really find anything I do is that risky. Um, and it might come from Dude. comedy because somebody says to me, he's like, well, how do you, I was going to give, I was giving this, this thing on, on camera confidence, this workshop. And one of the questions was like, how do you get up in front of all those people? You're going to make them laugh and you have the confidence to make them laugh. But it's like, no, this is a calculated risk is like, okay. Comedian thinks of an idea, something happens, they write it down. At most, the first thing you're going to do is tell one person. And see if it gets a little rise out of them. It's like, oh, okay. It's funny enough for me and that person. So then you're going to shake there's something them. there. There's something there. There's a seed. It's not hilarious yet, but there's something there. And then blah, 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 blah. And then you're in a group of people at a party and you, and you tell five people and they all laugh. They're like, oh, okay. How do I shape it a little bit more? Like nobody gets a, a comedy special where the, nobody starts comedy at Massey Hall in front of 2,000 people. You know, at most, you're going to start in a, a amateur night at 25 people. And before that 25 people, you would have told five or 10 people. So you keep growing your audience to the point of like, yeah, I get it. So by the time that we were doing venues of like a thousand people, we'd already done these sketches for smaller audiences and they were consistently hitting. So to get up in front of a thousand people, like I have the confidence to know that this is going to work. So I have the confidence to know that me shooting a portrait of anyone is going to go great because I've been doing it for 21 years. I know how to do it early in that 21 years. Like I would have been, I, w I was very skeptical. I was very um, cautious about how to go about this, but you just get to a point where you know how to do what to do. And so I don't really think I'm that risky. But okay, well, I'm going to change that. I'm going to change that a little bit because you just started this this whole conversation with. I reached out to somebody that I was a, True. really afraid to work So, so there was a there was a moment at which you said, "Hey, I've got an idea." Okay. You didn't say no to the idea. You wrote the email and you pressed send. So I'll give you. This is uh, something I've learned from a friend of mine. Um, she she's a clairvoyant and a very 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 interesting person. And literally all she does is get you to trust your own intuition. Like that's, that's literally her talent It's like, trust me, you know, the answer of what you want to do. And she's like, a lot of people say, what's the worst that could happen? But what if you rephrased it as what's the best that could happen? Ooh, so what, oh, oh, 
What's Ooh, the best Tony, thing that that's a good he one. He's back to me and I talk to him and he helps me. She's like, well, think even further. What if he needs help with something and that's why he's taking this phone call and he needs you? I'm like, Phew. my little brain can't even go that far. But what's the best that could happen? I'm going to write this one down here. <laughs> so what was the best? We already know what the best was. What was the best? What's the best that could happen? That's good. Hmm. So I, let me I, go back. Hold on. Yeah. So in terms okay. of just understanding this, <clears throat> we decided to leave Canada and we're just like anything can be better than this right now because the lockdowns and all this stuff is just, this is not the place to hang out. Well, by hook and crook, by some way or another, remember I called you because I wanted to go and move to the mountains? I ended up living in the mountains of Bulgaria on a ski hill, and I lived that dream goal of mine that I had no idea I was aligning with, but somehow I ended up doing it, and it is the biggest bucket list in my whole life because I finally got to do that thing. And the, and the thing that I find so funny about that, thing is i don't know if you remember now but you went and lived you actually went and lived in the mountains in the where you thought you wanted to go for a month or was it maybe yeah. six weeks or something like that and yeah. you discovered that the people there sucked and you didn't want to spend any more time with them and then when you decided to exit canada you're like how can we get out of here and now the train was moving now that now that now the well, i should say the car is moving train is moving a long track but a car you can steer but now this train is moving and you're like no no i'm gonna go to you started the netherlands right you you're, yeah. you're you've got a your wife's got a dutch passport or something like that so you're like hey let's go to Let's go yeah, to the we, Netherlands. And we and had we ended up in house. We had our grandmother's place yeah. in Amsterdam. We're like, let's go there. That's it's an easy decision because and you ended up in anybody. Bulgaria. <laughs> and then we ended up in Bulgaria. We ended up in Serbia. We we're just and okay. No, okay we, but the reason I say the reason I say uh, crazy is because and 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 risky is because to somebody who's sitting at the desk or who's somebody who's like, oh, I could never do anything like that. The idea of going to live for five months or six months or eight months in a country that they've never been to, whether the language they don't speak, um, that's dangerous. Um, they would, they would, they wouldn't get past, Hey, wouldn't it be cool if it would just stay at, Hey, wouldn't it be cool? This is why there's a lot to be said about aligning yourself with the things that you want. If you do that. And it's like, think about it in terms of like a vibrational alignment with the things that you want. Well, then whether you believe in, in manifestation or anything like that, literally, if you keep thinking about, I want a yellow car, you're, you're just, your thought patterns are always going to be towards looking for those things. You're going to end up getting it because you're, you're turning all of every, your, every micro decision in your life is starting to go towards, I want a yellow car. So, we were, what I wanted was to be somewhere that was free. That's what right. I wanted. And that's that was the I, target. That was the target. And we were in this town called Bansko, which is like a poor man's Banff. It was a beautiful Alpine town in the, in the middle of Bulgaria. And we're walking around saying, wow, it's really, really beautiful here. And then I hear a bunch of people talking, a family with a completely North American accent just walking on the street and I'm like, Hey, where are you guys from? They're like, Oh, we're from Texas. And I'm like, Oh, we're from Toronto. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? Blah, 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 blah. Within a couple of conversations and staying in touch, we took over the lease for their apartment. We took over the lease on their car. They showed us, uh, they gave us the lawyer to get our permanent residency. Like they just gave everything to us. I'm like, how did this happen? <laughs> what's the best that could happen what is the best that could happen well in that case you got to spend half a year in the mountains with your kids that's amazing Being every day so i can't i must attribute that quote to my friend mervat ignuda who runs the halo and uh, I, I didn't make it up amazing. what's the best that could happen uh, yeah i agree with that <laughs> I've had a lot of best that could happen. And you know what? So out of that, some of the worst happened too, but I found out, right? And you found out if, if you'd have never known, if you'd, have, if you'd have just sat there and not ever gone to the first mountain place to find out whether or not you liked it, you'd have never gone down that path. You'd have still be sitting here wondering, I wonder if I would like right. to go live in that town. And then if you waited so long that you're like, okay, now I'm retired and I'm going to go live in that town only to find out that, hey, the people suck and I don't want to be there. 
yeah. well, your time's up. You don't have any. You don't have any effort left. You don't have any time left. You're already half dead. Well, that would anyway. back to what you were saying about like people are like in their cubicle, like oh, I maybe I'll go do that one day when I retire. It's like that old story that I've I've heard. It's it's almost a meme, I think, but it's uh, the story of the two coworkers and the ones like, hey, what's wrong with you today? Because oh, I had a fight with my wife this morning. It's like, oh, okay. Uh, he goes, yeah, yeah. You know what? I think I when I get home, I'm going to apologize to her. And he says, well, what makes you think you're going to do that? And it's because I'll apologize when I get home. He says, no. What makes you think you're going to make it home? Mm. You have to apologize now. And right. that's all we have is now. And I know it's like that Eckhart Tolle kind of power of now stuff that I've heard of. I'd have never read it. I just kind of came to it on my own terms in a different way of, well, kinda, I, I literally sat in Amsterdam in a dark apartment one day and pondered the nature of reality. <laughs> and so if you want to go down that Seems path. Seems like a useful activity. I just watching the world fall apart. And just saying, man, what kind of life are my kids going to inherit? What kind of world are they going to inherit? And I just thought more and more and more. And then I said to myself, you know what? We All we really have is the stories that we're told unless we experience them. And and I guess in some cases it, it's what they call solipsism. But Say that word again. Solipsism. It's like you can only really believe what you've, uh, you have empirical knowledge of. If you've experienced it yourself. Okay. Kind of thing. So my mom told me that she went to cathedral high school in Hamilton, that she met my dad at a picnic and that he came over from Italy when he was 21. But prior to June 8, 1976 at 1130 in the morning, when I was brought into this world, I really have no experience of all that stuff. They really could have made up all that story. All I have is the choice to believe those stories and incorporate them into my story. So my kids, they have the stories that I had a traveling comedy troupe and their mother was an acrobat and we had this weird, crazy life, but they weren't alive to experience it. All they are is alive to experience what we give them now. On the other end is when I cease to exist, None of these are my problems anymore because I won't be around to experience them. All I have is now. And as a friend of mine said to me, when my kids were first born, he says, because his kids were 10 at the time, he says, you can't promise your kids a great future because there's too many variables. All you can do is give them a good past. And you do that in the present. So I started thinking, mm -hmm. like, well, what's the thing I can do right now that tomorrow the kids are going to say, oh, dad did that thing yesterday. You know, so all I got is right now. That's all. And that's all anybody ever has is right now. So it's not worth worrying about, well, if I move to that country or if I decide to live in a hammock on the beach, like what's going to happen to me? It's like, you're going to be on a hammock on the beach. I know that much. Like, but you can't, you will make your own prison by worrying about a future that doesn't exist yet. Right. Now, I want to. I recorded a podcast a couple of days ago about um, making friends, and I, you've mentioned that <laughs> my friend told me this, my friend told me that, my friend told me this. I went with a bunch of friends here. You got a lot of friends. I want to know what your thoughts are on on making friends, and and uh, um, well, I, I'm your friend, and so I I know firsthand that you're a good friend. Why? What? What? Why? What? What do you do? What do you mean? What do I do? What, what, what do you do? How do you get people around? You, 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 how do you, how do you get people on your side and, and be excited for you? And, and you know what I've learned in the last few you. years actually is that, um, personality is like a grenade and you just got to throw it into a crowd. And there are going to be some people that run and there's going to be some people that stick around when that personality explodes. And the per people that mm. stuck around that love that personality, they will come for more of that. And you just end up attracting people that you are uh, attracted, that attract you. Right. And so, and the people that run away from that personality grenade, they're not worth your time anyways. They're of a different ilk. They're of a different vibrational alignment. So 
back to your thing of truth is a lot of times, and this is in the last couple of years, is just, boom, hey, this is, uh, this is what I think about that thing. And people that are, yeah, I think the same thing. You know what? I've been looking for a sounding board of somebody like this. Then you end up attracting those people, and there's a lot of love in that. And other people, you can just see them shy away and just like, uh, I'm not going to talk to that guy. I was like, cool. This is for the best of, for the both of us. So the fear of the unknown future keeps you from meeting people and affecting other people's lives. Okay. I'll say that again, because we were talking about the fear of the, 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 the fear of this unknown future that the, all you have is now that, that you got to do something now that the kids will remember in the past. And that if you spend your time worrying about the thing that's going to happen in the future. So if you have this fear that, that, Oh, if I say something bold or funny or how I actually feel or a joke that, may bomb i'm gonna fear somebody maybe being offended or fear no, somebody not liking not me. me some people i would i think people uh do fear that but i i've learned to just blah here's the true here's the true me and if you're in, if you dig that you got a friend in me for life and i've just mm. it's not that it was a conscious decision it was just i've seen it happen i've just seen people flock to what I'm offering, just like I'm, I'm flocked to, oh man, like the thing I always saw in you is I'm like, man, that guy is fearless. I want some <laughs> of that energy. I, and that's the thing is like the, the idea that healers don't heal you. They just give you access to that energy, you know? So you, you, every time I would talk to you and we'd have those late night chats, I'd be like, I just, I want that fearlessness, that that Dave Pong mm. has. Interesting. I love that fearlessness. By the way, that's a practice trait. That is a that <laughs> is a practice. That is a practice trait because you know, I I um, our bot. Okay, I'm gonna run away on a little rabbit hole here, but our bodies love being comfortable. Yeah. Okay, but our souls or spirits don't grow in comfort. Okay, we don't we don't become better men or better women in comfort. We do it in discomfort, in hard times, in trials, in severe excitement or severe, you know, depression or de down. That's where the the hardship comes. We go to the gym. It's not comfort that's building our muscles. It's we have to push our muscles to the max so that they grow. Okay, the growth comes through the 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 pain, the hardship. And what I find so interesting is that being uncomfortable is actually a skill. You can actually learn to be uncomfortable. And because growth comes with discomfort and you can only grow in discomfort, then if you want to grow, you have to learn how to be uncomfortable. So like stupid little things like, okay, at the end of this really enjoyable shower, I'm going to crank the water cold until I can't stand here any longer and then get out and not turn it back warm is saying to your body, like, no, no, you, you don't get to decide. I'm a, I get to be uncomfortable today so that I can grow. So it's that, that choice to no, I'm going to be the guy who grows. I'm not going to be the guy that, that is just comfortable and sits in my cubicle. I'm, I'm, I'm picking on the cubicle right now, but <laughs> that's not all of what I mean. So, um, now I've been teaching it to my kids where it's like, okay, you know, we're going to go, what are we doing today? We're going to go to a BMX park. Okay, sweet. Let me go to the BMX park. Okay, we're done with the BMX park. We're going to put the bikes back in the car. And now uh, I, I happen to have your bathing suits in the car. We're going to go dip in a glacier-fed river. And I'll tell you what, uh, if both of you, if both of you can submerse yourself in the glacier river, we'll stop for slushies on the way home at 7-Eleven. And it's like, oh, now I got to get uncomfortable to get the slushie. Now, how much fun I have it on video. I should I should release it on our, our, our YouTube channel. I have it on video of them and going through the process of coming to the realization of how hard it, it was a warm day, but it's cold water, how hard it is to get over that. My oldest son, who is like the, the, the champion sport guy, it's like, I want to succeed at this. So he's going to like, he's going to do it. My youngest son, he's like, I like being comfortable. I don't want to go in that water, but even worse than going in the water is disappointing my brother that he doesn't get a slushy. I don't go in the water. Yeah. And so it's like, 
like you could see his body's just fine screw it i'm going in and just jumps right in and i'm like oh man i was so proud of him <laughs> so proud of him in that moment but he gets out and i said how bad was it he's like it was bad i said was it was it worse than not getting a slushy no <laughs> And so we went and got a slash. But it's like you got to you got to teach yourself. You got to teach your kids. You got to teach you know the people around you that, so that, that being have, uncomfortable is okay. I have a story about this that I just got off with that um, on camera confidence uh, workshop that we're doing. Is you know how do we teach these people that are uncomfortable on camera or uncomfortable on TV? Is I remember first year theater school was. Okay, you're going to stand in in the middle of the class and everyone's in a circle and you're not allowed to talk and everyone's just going to stare at you for five minutes. That's super uncomfortable. But once you get past that threshold, you're like, okay, that's what it's like to be uncomfortable. This is my file folder analogy, is that all your experiences are a file folder, okay? And I got I came up with this when my, ki my first kid fell off of his bike and he scraped his knee. And it was like the end of the world. And I'm like, man, you know how many more times you're going to scrape your knee falling off a bike? <laughs> but this is the first one. But just think, the next time, you can instantly like, oh, wait, hold on a second. Oh, scrape the knee. It's nothing. And you can just go back to that file folder, right? Mm -hmm. And those are your experiences that you build up in this file folder. So like, you know, oh, oh uh, you know, losing a girlfriend. Okay, the first one was bad. But then you can go back and like, oh, I survived that. And like, you know, the death of a parent, the death of a, a dog, like whatever, you can always go back to those things and just help console yourself into, into like, you got past the uncomfortable of what that was. You do have that experience. You have that, that, that piece of file folder. I was teaching, uh, I was teaching Jack, my oldest, um, panic intentionally, like how to deal with panic and how to, how I was, I happened to be reading a book at the time talking about great performers versus poor performers, you know, airline pilots, one who had a terrible plane accident, but landed and another who had a, had a no accident, no problem mm. and crashed the plane, that kind of stuff. And it's like, well, what makes one person succeed and the other not? And the, the, the short version of that story is that it's somebody who is always processing the world around him, always giving different variations of, of possible outcomes. It's thinking through possibilities It's always gathering and processing information. So, I'm teaching this to my to my son and he we were in the ocean and he got into an area that he wasn't comfortable in he hadn't been in before and he panicked and that fear okay fear turns to panic if not dealt with so fear is like hey we need more information panic is like i'm not getting any more information anymore i just wow. i shut down so anyways so he gets into that that point and he's like eh, freeze and you know intervention is necessary so i run and grab him pull him out stand him there he's like shaking like oh i don't know i was scared blah 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 and so i'm like okay Here's what you need to do when that feeling comes upon. When that fear comes on you, like, I'm not sure what to do here. You need to keep gathering information. And so I'm like, do you understand? Yeah, I understand. Okay, great. I understand. Sweet. Okay, we're going to practice it right now. And I threw him right back into the same wave. Literally threw, threw him into the ocean. <laughs> he didn't like me at that point. But he didn't freeze. He swam. Okay? He didn't swim well. But he swam. He moved. He did something. He gathered some information. So anyways, grabbed him right back out of there, stuck on the side, calmed him down, and then we talked about it. Okay, this is what you need to do in pan when that feeling of panic comes. Anyways, so fast forward like two months. We're in winter in Canada. We're, we're ripping around the driveway on an ATV, and I'm watching him, and he's losing, he loses control, and he's heading straight towards a wall. And he's going fast enough. He's going to hit that wall. And it's like, oh, okay. He's about to hit that wall. And you can see his whole body freeze up, like all the muscles just tense up mm. for, for a split second. Mm. And then you could see his whole body relax. And he looked to the left and he turned the bike and missed the wall. Nice. And he jumped off the bike, jumped off the bike in like super excited, daddy, 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 I did it. I panicked. I was about to panic. I didn't. And I got myself out of the situation. Okay. So we, we, you know, high five, chest bump, whatever, all's good. You've learned that lesson. Okay, fast forward now, eight months. We're back at the same ocean and he's met a friend who's on a surfboard and he's only on a boogie board. And if you don't know the difference, boogie board, it's short and it's not really meant for going out in the water. It's for staying on the shore. 
but but he's like no no i want to follow the surf guy i'm like all right so fine he's go he's out in the ocean now with he can swim well but he's out in the ocean with uh, um, a boogie board along with a guy with a surfboard and you know no life vest or whatever you don't do that when you're out in the ocean um so they're going all the way out to the break and it's it's a ways out i'm on the beach i'm watching him but i'm like okay he's out there but I've, I've informed him. He's making his own choices. He's, he's out there doing his thing. Keep an eye on him. Well, all of a sudden he gets out towards the, the rolling waves and the wave rolls him. And he's a long ways out there and he doesn't have a strap on his board and the board washes all the way into shore. So now he's out in the ocean, <laughs> out in the ocean by himself. I'm like, well, okay. So I jump up, I run down the beach. I, I dive into the ocean, but it's going to be several minutes before I get to him. It's not like a, I'm going to be there right away. It's going to be a bit, you know, wave would come up. I could see him in the distance. Wave would come up. I could see him in the distance. Anyways, I get out to him. He's got this big smile on his face. He's totally relaxed. I'm like, Hey man, what's going on? He's like, oh, I'm just swimming for my board. He's like halfway in already. I'm like, Oh man, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. That was one of my proudest moments as a parent, knowing that, the lessons he'd learned were actually going to give him tools to get through life well. Right. Anyways, as a, again, I love rabbit holes. Rabbit holes are great. Yeah. No, I hear you, man. There's a, uh, that's, um, I'm a terrible swimmer. And uh, if I'm in a pool, I have the knowledge to know that the, the edge is there. And so I'm really calm, mm. but in the ocean, where's the edge? What do it like? If the boat's nearby, I'm all right. But like, and I'll, I go into panic and it's not a skill I've, I've, uh, figured out yet. Hmm. Well, in Toronto, you're not spending a whole lot of time in the ocean. So. I am not. And, and I, I enjoy my water frozen. Hence the skiing yeah. months in Bulgaria. Oh, that's sweet. Um, sweet. Do we, I don't know, anything else we need to cover? I don't know. No. Let's hang out here for a second. Where are you? You, you, you uh, I'm, I'm right now in British Columbia because I had to come back. I just had to do some work before we went off to Spain. Mm. So I, the rest of my family is in Mexico. I I'm here for two days and then I'm back to Mexico and then off to Tennessee and then off to Spain and then Cyprus and then Italy. What's in Tennessee? Because, uh, the people we're going to Europe with live there. Oh. And so we are meeting up with them there and all flying together. Awesome. So it's going to be awesome. It's going to be different. Um, I'm stepping out and doing a bunch of things I've never done, but we figure we got to do something different anyways. So why not do the thing we actually want to do and go do that? Well, you know what? It, so, back to this whole thing of the podcast that you were talking about is, and fear is I have just learned there is so much power to be said in the words I am because you have to come. Mm. If you haven't convinced yourself, how are you going to convince anybody else? Right. And yep. what I have noticed I've suffered when, when I, when I came back to Canada, I, I said to myself, I was like, no, I am this incredibly quirky and funny photographer. And that's what people are going to, that's what, that's what I'm, that's the energy I'm putting out and people will just suck it in and, and believe it. Right. Which I'm not lying. Cause I feel it for my soul that I am. But by that, this, and the other thing is somehow I've ended up connecting with people back in entertainment and I'm in the midst of developing three different shows. I'm writing sketches. Um, by, I'm auditioning for things. Like, I'm just, how did I end up here? Like, I don't need, you just, it's one step at a time. And then when you step back, you're like, whoa, what? Okay how did all that happen? But I'm here doing it. I'm enjoying the thing I'm doing right now. And the next moment I'll enjoy the thing I'm doing at that moment. But there's no reason to worry about five moments from now. So I like to think that you only have a lamp on your forehead and you're walking through the forest, or up a mountain trail, um, at nighttime. Yeah. And all you can see 
all you can see is the little light that's illuminating what's around your feet. You can't see the pitfalls to your right or to your left or what hurdles are coming up. And you're never looking backwards, right? Like the light oh. shines forward in like a little arc. And let's, that's all you get to see. Let's expand that analogy in the manifestation world in terms of what you can create for yourself is you really only have that illumination or even like, you know, that sonar radar submarine blipping thing, right? Sure. But there are things that exist outside of that sphere that you have no idea of. So like when, you know, Mervat says to me, he's like, well, what's the best that could happen? I'm like, well, this guy gives me an hour of his time. So like, well, what, what, what can your mind not even comprehend? It's like, what if he needs your help? I'm like, well, that wasn't even on my radar. I'm like, exactly. But it might be out there in that darkness. It just hasn't come into your, your field yet. So this is where two things sort of collide is she'll say things like the universe is stacked in your favor to everybody. You just doubt it so much that things will work out. And I've been spending a lot of time thinking about um, that Michelangelo's um, creation of man, right? That yep. painting is so brilliant to me because God is stretching out to touch man and man is just, can just touch him, right? And it's like God's cape is in the shape of the brain, right? It's the mind. And I'm like, there's just this crazy analogy that I haven't wrapped my head around yet, but there's something about somebody, something, some energy wants to help you. You just have to embrace it and take it in. And I know you and I have talked about this before as well. Um, I think there's, there's something there that things will work out for you. You just, you can be your own worst enemy about it. You just have to embrace that. Whatever's in the darkness there is, is there to help you. I believe it's an age old question for a reason of what's the purpose of life. I got an answer for that. I heard, which I like. Go for it. Yeah. There is no, uh, there is no purpose to life. Life is the purpose you inject into it. So for the people that you change, for the people that you help, you know, at the end of it, when you take a tally of how was your life? It's like all the people you affected in a positive way, that was the, that was the purpose of life. You know, the way, the way I say it is that life isn't meant to be lived alone. Sure. You know, our, some of our, some of, I, I heard it said the other day, um, it could have been in a, in a real or, I don't know where, I don't remember where it came from, but, um, it was when, when something great happens, when, when you see the most magnificent thing you've ever seen, when you smell or taste or you experience greatness what do you do what's the first thing you do you tell somebody i would you share it with somebody yeah. else yeah. you get so full of joy that it has to come out right and you have to share it you can't handle it all yourself <laughs> you have to share it with somebody it's like it's like uh it's like in the marvel movies when when they they get one of the infinity stones oh but if you share it with the people around you you know you can all you can all share the, it's like, it's like the positive side of that, where it's like, you know, you're so full of joy that you have to share it with the world around you. And then the world, like, and, and it, it, it compounds. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nonlinear equation, shall we say it's, it's exponential when, you know, when you spread joy to one person. Okay. So a quick little, quick little nothing story. I'm in the airport. I, I'm, we've been in an airport a lot lately. Uh, we over, we overnighted in Charlotte on the way down to Mexico and we, um, we, it was late flight, whatever. There was a bunch of people delayed there at the same time. And we had to, was, we get on the, we we're trying to get to our hotel, trying to get to our overnight hotel. And I'm standing there on the side of the road and the bus that we need is, is right there. And it's just a van. Like it's a seven seater kind of like shove some people in van, but there's a lot of people trying to get hotel rooms. And, and so anyways, I see him, I flag him down. He, he's like, Oh, sorry, man. I'm, I'm full for your family of four. I'll be right back to get you. I said, no problem. No problem to get, get here when you get here. It's all good. Right. And uh, so about eight minutes later, he, he shows up back around, maybe 10 minutes later. And of course there's another slew of people wanting to get on the van. So I, I'm, I just stand back and like, yeah, it's good. You guys go ahead, shove on the van. I'll take the next one. It's all good. Anyways, he, he catches me on his way back. He's like, Hey, wait, Hey, wait a minute. I, I came back here for you. I said, 
dude, it's all good. You take these people, you come get me the next time. Or, you know, grab my wife and so the kids and the wife can get, can get there and I'll, I'll get there in the next time. He's like, no, I'm getting you on this van. And so he takes my bags and like shoves them into the corner of the, like if he had a roof rack, he'd have used the roof rack. And then he opened the slides, open the door. He's like, everybody squish in. And so it's now sardines in there, right? It's four people more into this little van. So we're sitting here. It's about a, about a five minute, you know, car ride to the hotel and everybody's uncomfortable. I'm never uncomfortable. I'm never, never, rarely uncomfortable in life. So I'm fine. But, but the, you know, people are, are agitated and whatnot. And the guy in front of me makes some kind of snippy, sarcastic remark about funny or whatever. And I said, oh, I'd, I, I had no idea. I didn't realize you were so funny. And just that little hint into funny, a few people laughed. Nice. And then he, cut, he quipped something back that was funny. And then I quipped something to him that was funny. Well, within 30 seconds, the entire van, including the driver and the, everybody awesome. that was squished in there, were now laughing. It was so enjoyable. And then everybody started talking and, oh, yeah, well, this and that. And the other thing. By the time we left that five-minute van ride, everybody was friends. And we were all, like, standing in line at the hotel, like, oh, yeah, well, I'm going here. It's like it totally changed from angry to joyful just by injecting one little fire poker of joy. And it just spread throughout. The right. It's just so it's amazing to me. Life, life breeds life, right? But, and who's to say that if you got on the other bus, it would have been full of people that would not have received any of that, and it would have been a miserable ride. There's a lot to be said about been. the ride you got was mm -hmm. the perfect right ride you needed. I am where I am, therefore I am. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Life's fun. Life's fun. It, I, I, love, I love killing with great people. Well, dude, this is a cool little uh, box break you got going on. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I'm going to keep going. I would like to have you back on. Let's get this thing established. Let's get a few more episodes on there, and we'll bring you back on and find out how your comedy thing is going. And uh, I don't know, maybe we can we can throw a little bit more structure and dive into some of the crazy other stuff that we chat about, like like uh, like how to actually stay healthy and not get sick, and you know. Mm have our bodies enjoy life and be able to, you know, shuttle us through this world and, and be able to move and, and, and breathe and run. And I'm, I'm, I don't, how old are you, Tony? Uh, 47 now. 47. I'm, 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 I'm 41. And I mean, I'm my body. I feel like I'm 16. Uh, I, <laughs> and I still do things like I'm 16. Anyways, we can probably dive into that the next time, but dude, I love you, man. Thank you for coming on here. Don't run away here when I press the, the end button, but sure, um, sure. Um, thanks for, thanks for jumping on and I'll be sure to have you on here again. So anyways, thanks so much. And uh, till the next time. Love it.